from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our next guests are co-authors of This Is Just a Test, Madeline Rosenberg and Wendy Wenlong Shang. When she was in fifth grade, Madeline Rosenberg wrote a story entitled How the Raccoon Got His Mask. Is that correct? Yeah. Her family took this as a clue that she'd become an author of children's literature as an adult. And she did just that. Madeline Rosenberg has written many books appealing to kids of all ages, such as How to Behave at a Tea Party, The Nanny X Books, her middle uh, grade and young adult books include The Canary in a Coal Mine and Dream Boy. And fans love her for their humor, or fans love her books for their humor and inventiveness. When Wendy Lung, Wen Lung Shang was a young girl, she realized that books gave her the freedom to, quote, learn about anything, go anywhere, pretend to be anyone, end quote. It's no surprise that she became an author. Her award-winning books include The Great Wall of Lucy Wu and The Way Home Looks Now. Their newest book, This Is Just a Test, tells the story of a bicultural young man trying to make sense of the world around him in Cold War 80s America. Reviewers and readers alike give it a big thumbs up. So be sure to stop by the Politics and Prose Bookshop to pick up a copy and then get it signed between 11 a.m. and noon. So without further ado, let's give a round of applause and a warm welcome to Madeline Rosenberg and Wendy Wenlung Shang. Good morning, everyone. I'm Wendy Shang. I'm Madeline Rosenberg. And as you just said, we are the authors of This Is Just a Test. So how many of you have ever seen two people get into a fight and wonder, should you speak up or maybe if you just kept quiet, everything would blow over. That's pretty much what's going on with our main character, David Dawei Horowitz, who is half Chinese and half Jewish. And no one in David's world is getting along. His grandmothers don't get along, and his friends aren't getting along. It's the 80s, so really it feels like the world isn't getting along. But when David starts entertaining the idea that he could leave a friend out of an important project, he learns that there are no shortcuts to peace. And we're going to start by, I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning. Even though we work together, we are different heights, so I need a smaller one. <laughs> so our book starts out where David's class is on a school field trip at a farm in Virginia where almost everything on the farm is dead, including the poison ivy. The teachers told a group of us to sit at the picnic tables so they could pass around seeds and dry gourds, which Mr. McKimmon actually did grow. Hector, my best friend, squirmed between the bench and the table and ducked underneath. What are you doing, I asked. The other kids were giving Hector a look. It's shadier down here, Hector said. One thing I'll say about Hector, he is not afraid to be unconventional. It used to be a quality I admired, like when Hector suggested that we do everything backwards for a week, or when he signed us up for correspondence classes in French because he wanted to go to the Cannes Film Festival one day. But in junior high, unconventionality was usually just another word for dork. Knock it off, I told Hector. I was pretty sure under the transitive property of junior high school social lives, whatever our group was thinking of Hector, they were going to start thinking of me. Hector popped back up. My little brother does that all the time, said Kellyanne Majors. I happen to know that Kellyanne's little brother was eight. It was one of the facts I had collected about her. It was also exactly what I was afraid someone would think. Watch this, said Scott Dursky, who was in a couple of my classes. Under normal circumstances, I ignored Scott and his stunts, but now he was providing a distraction, the good kind. I watched him, hoping everyone else would too, as he walked to the oak tree that had a bunch of vines attacking the trunk. They looked like tentacles. Scott grabbed one to try to get some climbing leverage, but the vine was loose, and it fell out of the tree while he was holding it. Terry Sepfin stood behind him and said, nice try, let me show you how it's done. Scott grabbed a different vine for a better hold. It was furry. Even from where we were sitting, I could tell it was poison ivy. 
that's poison ivy, I told Hector. They shouldn't be touching that. Hey, Hector shouted, that's poison ivy. Says who? Scott didn't let go of the vine, but you could see his grip relax slightly. Says David, said Hector. We walked over to the tree. I don't see any leaves, said Hector. You can get poison ivy from the vine too, I told him. You know, hairy vine, no friend of mine. It still contains arushiol. I've never heard that, Scott said, but he let go of the vine. He's making it up, said Terry. He patted the vine, which looked like the tail of a scruffy cat. This is my pet, Lucky. He would never hurt me. Don't you want to meet my pet? He reached for the closest girl, who shrieked and ran away. Why would I make it up, I said. If I were going to make something up, it would be something like studying too much for your bar mitzvah can stunt your growth, or eating only Chinese food causes premature baldness. Personally, I would like to spend a lot less time studying Torah and more time eating pizza. And that's sort of how we begin our story about David. So it's a little strange for us in, in anything basically in the kid lit world that's older than 10 years, it's set more than 10 years in the past, is considered historical fiction. So the, but even knowing that, it's a little devastating to realize that something set in the 80s is considered historical fiction. But when you think about it, when we start thinking about it, like we realize that there are things from the 80s that we mention in the book that would be completely foreign to young readers today. So, and we wanted to remind you people, when, when you start, well, you know, if you're tempted to start laughing at some of these things, that one day that, that maybe 2017 will seem kind of, kind of historical. That's right. If you guys are walking around and you've seen people with clothes where the shoulders are exposed, I think it's called the cold shoulder, right? That's going to be 2017. And there are, 2000, there are different voices, different vocabulary that people are going to be using in the future so that the things we say now are going to be strange. And foods are one of the things that um, I think is, was different when we were growing up. And I don't have Diet Coke in this picture, but I should because, you know, you see Diet Coke everywhere, right? That wasn't invented until 1982. Wait, hold on. One microphone. Another thing that was different were video games. Who here likes to play video games? Oh, yeah. So what do you use your thumbs, right? Right? You have a screen, and like you can see lots of cool stuff. Well, video games looked a little different, and we played them a little differently when we were growing up. So this is a picture from a game called, do you know, do you know the name? Space Invaders, good job. And instead of getting to use your thumbs and these virtual buttons and everything, we got to use this. Look at this, look at the range of motion on this thing. <laughs> yeah, you have those? <laughs> so we thought we'd demonstrate for you what it was like to play with this. So Madeline is going to be my avatar. Okay, I remember, we, and we could only see them from the side. So it'd be like, go, 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 go. And then maybe jump, <laughs> jump. So you guys have it much better than we did. <laughs> Um, also, computers were something that looked a little bit different. They were, not many of us even had them. They certainly weren't something that you carried around like a purse or in your purse. Right. And in fact, how many of you use a thumb drive at school or at work, right? So this is, this is actually the more updated version of what we had to work with, okay? This holds <laughs> two megabytes so if you wanted to have enough storage to have the same amount in your 16 gigabyte, do you know how many you would need? I can't get you what? Well, they were called floppies, but they were, they were, the, the first ones were really skinny, and you could wave them back and they would kind of wiggle. These were like the more updated versions. But if you wanted to have the same, num the same amount of memory in a 16 gigabyte thumb drive, and wanted, oh. And a 16 gigabyte thumb drive, as you could in one of these, you would need over 11,000 of these. <laughs> and then speaking about carrying things around in a purse, you guys want to guess what's in here? What's in there? What do you think? What'd you say? Another one of these? <laughs> yeah, we started carrying the 11,000 in the purse? No. This is... Can you get it out? The Velcro is super strong in here. 
That was a cell phone. That's a cell phone. Okay, and this is really, wait, you, you have to take it, wait. You have to take it all the way out with a very strong pull. <laughs> Velcro, look at this, guys. Do you want to make a phone call? Here's your antenna. Dot, dot. Right? And do you ever ever wonder why we say hang up the phone? Right? Because you hang up the phone. <laughs> And when you talked into it, it sounded like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then uh, speaking of other expressions, we had expressions from the 80s, like if you thought something was totally gross, you might say, gag me with a spoon. Or That did not get as far as Southwest Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the, what do you think, what are the, some of the phrases that you guys have now that might seem like unusual? What do you think? What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Or like LOL. Did I say LOL? Yeah, yeah, a lot of those. They weren't around when we were on, and there might be something totally different 30 years from now. And then the things that we wore were a lot of different, really different from they are now. The clothes were different, the colors were different. The hair was different. Our hair was very different. <laughs> so we wanted to take a moment to discuss to you the importance of shoulder pads in the 80s. This was considered a very important accessory. So let's say you just had a regular day at school. You might just have a one shoulder pad situation, right? So it makes you look strong and powerful. But what if, you know, you had a book report? Well, then you would want definitely a bigger shoulder pad. And if you were in trouble and, you know, you might have to go visit the principal, you would definitely want the biggest shoulder pads you had. So look at the pictures carefully. You can see the difference. So don't it look more powerful on this side? <laughs> I, you know, it, it was a little strange. It was a little strange. And how did we listen to music? Here we go. Right. All right. All right. So we used Walkmans to listen to music and we put cassette tapes in the Walkmans. And even though CDs came out in the 80s, this was usually the, the method. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. They just had, they had one minor technical flaw where things occasionally went wrong and the tape would come out. But we had a, we had a fix. You could wind. All right, we need a volunteer because we know we might need this tape again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Wow. So the things that we used when we were researching, because we had to research our childhoods a little bit, and when you research your childhood, you come across props, and they become sort of the backdrop of the story. But the main parts of our story, the things that were most important, are things that kind of exist all of the time, through all of the ages. Friendship. And family. Conquering your fears. And awkwardness, like if your hair gets really frizzy because <laughs> it's raining. We're fairly convinced that awkwardness is a common theme throughout the ages that, you know, not every 10-year-old in ancient Rome had his toga securely fastened, leading to awkward moments. But we wanted to share an awkward moment from our book. So at this point, have you ever accidentally, like, hit somebody? You know, like, you're kind of, like, waving stuff around and you accidentally bonk somebody and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. So our main character is actually accidentally bonked the girl he's really he really likes and his sister, Lauren, is refusing to bail him out. Here's another question for the how to talk to girls category of Trivial Pursuit. Say you just whacked Kellyanne Majors in the face with what's supposed to be a bag of poop. Do you continue to pretend that the bag is full of dog poop and thereby cre forever create, in her mind, a link between you and dog poop? Or cop to only pretending to pick up dog poop and thereby forever create, in her mind, a link between you and fake dog poop. 
I ended up doing something else altogether, which was to trip over Bao Bao's leash and fall to the ground while saying something suave like, gah, gah. Lauren and Kelly Ann leaned over me. Bao Bao wrapped the leash around me one more time and began licking my face. Considering the last thing I saw him doing with that tongue, I was not too excited about this. Are you okay, David? asked Kellyanne. I didn't mean to freak you out. She adjusted her hat. It was green, which made her dark eyes more noticeable. He's fine, said Lauren less sympathetically. She grabbed my hand, pulling me to my feet. You're so weird. The button girl, Kellyanne said. That's Lauren, I said. Kellyanne pointed to my back. I don't want to ask, but is that dog... I quickly decided, fake dog poop was still better than dog poop. Poop? I held up the bag and let out a big laugh, like the last thing a person would have in a bag while walking a dog was poop. No, no, it's pine cones. Pine cones? Kellyanne shook her head. What are you carrying pine cones in a bag for? Why, indeed? I looked at Lauren, who gave me the you're on your own look. Why am I carrying pine cones in a plastic bag, I said, stalling for time. Yes. From the tone of her voice, Kellyanne was no longer worried about my physical well-being. It was my mental state that was now in question. I looked at the Mason's house, which was across the street from Grandma's house, and they'd already started decorating for Christmas, which is something people do around here on Thanksgiving Day. Don't ask me why. For a wreath, I said. A pine cone wreath. A wreath? Yes. Because we're Jewish, said Lauren not so helpfully. I gave her the evil eye behind Kellyanne's back. Hanukkah wreath, I mumbled. I'd never seen a Hanukkah wreath, probably because they didn't exist. But it sounded like something that could exist. The Abrams put up yellow and blue Christmas lights and called them Hanukkah lights. Wait, said Kelly. I, I thought you were Chinese. I'm both, I said. You can be Chinese and Buddhist or Chinese and Taoist or Chinese and Jewish. I managed to stop blabbering before I paired being Chinese with every religion on earth. But there aren't too many Chinese Jews around here, I added. It almost felt like a trivia question. How many Chinese Jews live in Virginia? Answer, ha, 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 what are you talking about? So when we were both growing up, we grew up in different parts of the state. And I was the only Jewish kid in Southwest Virginia. I mean, there were a couple of others. There was Ezra Perlmutter, but it mostly felt like me and Ezra Perlmutter. And Wendy grew up in Northern Virginia with actually one of the few Chinese American kids growing up. So when we met, we sort of bonded over the fact that we were only. And I mean, we were a lot more than just Jewish or just Chinese, as everybody is. We're all multiple things. But when we did our reading when we were kids, we were trying to look for ourselves. And, you know, I did find myself in A Wrinkle in Time. I saw myself in Meg or in reading Harriet the Spy, I saw myself in Harriet. Wendy did too. Yes. All right, All right. awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, this was um, the first book that I looked in and I saw a Jewish kid and I thought, oh my gosh, this book is just like me. This girl is just like me. Even though I had never owned a pinafore and I didn't live in New York in the early 1900s, but just the fact that she was the same religion of me made a huge difference. So. And for me, that same book was Blubber by Judy Bloom. Now, the main character in Blubber is not Chinese American, but her best friend is. And she has kind of a side role in the story, but that meant the world to me because I had never seen in a book a portrayal of a Chinese American girl who lived in modern times. And I think, like, subconsciously, one of my other books is called The Great Wall of Lucy Wu, and the main character's name is Tracy Wu. And I think I was trying to, like, subconsciously connect them. So when we were writing, we talked about being onlys. And, of course, when we wrote this book, we wrote it together. So we weren't onlys anymore. And it's a lot less lonely. If anybody had seen my office and how messy it is, it would be nice to get out of that office <laughs> to go write with somebody else. Yeah. So this is me at my bat mitzvah, because um, little bits of our lives do show up in this book. And this is me when I was in high school in the 80s, and I got the, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, um, 
I was trying, I was trying to do what were they called the preppy style. So I had my sweater over my shoulders. And what I drew from that for David was David likes to do trivia contests and I did forensics contests. And I think the connection is, you know, we like to try new things and then get better at them. And that's what David's trying to do. So the day after was a television show. It was a movie made for TV that aired in the 80s. And it was super scary. It was about what life would be like if a nuclear bomb went off. And for us, another thing that was different about the 80s is there was no Netflix and chill. We did not have that many TV channels. So everybody watched this show. And it got us really scared. Yeah. And so that fear, and what we found is that every decade of people, they're afraid of something else and something different. But we've all gotten through all of those decades. So. And that one thing we hope you take away is that we can all be peacemakers, whether you start small at home or you try to extend to something beyond just your backyard. We can all do stuff. So we also want to talk about some of the other factors um, that went into the story. Um, so we had food we talked about. We have dumplings and latkes. We talked about going to different language schools. I went to Chinese school. Madeline's kids go to Hebrew school. And we talked about like how we all both had this connection to Virginia. So all those things kind of play into the story. And then there's the good old trivial pursuit. <laughs> And also friendship, because the fact that I think we were friends made a really big difference in our ability to be able to write and to write together. Do you want to talk about that, any? And then we'll, well, I think we have like we have like one minute. So, if any, does anybody have any questions? Any ideas? Yeah. How did we meet? Oh, we met in writers group. We both belong to the Society of Children's Book, Children's Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and I was invited to join Madeline's group. Yeah. We did. And because we were the same age and we had kids the same age, we kind of bonded over that and got to know each other better. And when we were writing this book, we got to know each other better, better. <laughs> oh, we have a question over here? Yeah. I know, I know. I, I kind of felt like I, that book, like, yeah, so after I wrote that, he's talking about um, my book, The Great Wall of Lucy Wu, and I mentioned Yao Ming and Pat Summit. Unfortunately, yeah, Pat Summit has gone. That's right. That's right. That's right. And Yao Ming retired. I was like, oh my gosh, I better not put any more professional athletes in my book. I know, I think from now on, we can only mention fake people in our books <laughs> instead of real people. <laughs> any other okay. questions? Any other questions? Questions or comments? So I'll ask Wendy a question. Okay. What works better for you, writing alone or writing together? Oh. Well, I I like both. I think I like having both actually because writing alone is super lonely. And what I loved writing with you was that when I got tired of writing, I'd be like, ping here, Madeline, catch. <laughs> what about you? Right. One question a lot of people ask us is, how did you write together? Right? Because sometimes, you know, you're trying to decide what movie to go see or you're trying to decide what restaurant to go to for dinner. You argue with the other person, right? So how do you argue over 250 pages? <laughs> but it actually worked really well for us. Um, basically, we took turns. You've got to talk really, really loud because we can't hear you. You've got to come all the way up here and talk to us. We can't hear. Oh, our favorite children's books. Oh, oh. oh wow. You know, one of my, uh, one of the books I come back to is um, a series called The Great Brain. And it's about a boy growing up in Utah in the 19th century and their lives are so different from ours. And he had a horse and I love horses. So I was super jealous. Uh, and mine was The Phantom Tollbooth mm -hmm. because it was really one of the first books that taught me how fun it could be to play with words. And I'm reading the sign that says wrap it up. So thank you. We're going to wrap it up. Thank you guys so, so much for listening. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. 
visit us at loc.gov.